without further ado, uh, we'll introduce ourselves. Well, hello. Greetings from Ambridge, Pennsylvania. We had our own little Trump apocalypse here what, on Monday. Uh, Trump was in town, a huge rally, and a lot of people turned out here in Ambridge, Pennsylvania, in the Rust Belt for, uh, for that event. Mm -hmm. So um, who are we talking right now? We are Dave and Aaron Neinhauser of the Hear Yourself Think Project. Hear Yourself Think is a 501c3 nonprofit, and uh, you can see by our very dramatic logo that we have um, an important, intense, and urgent message. So our logo is actually modeled after a poison warning label, only for us, it's labeling toxic media that misinforms and uses conspiracy and fear to shut down the critical thinking citizens need to function in a democracy. Yep, like Mr. Yuck, only for poisonous noise like Fox, Limbaugh, and Alex Jones. So we uh, told you a little bit about uh, Charlie Rebick, but I wanted to give him a fuller introduction. And again, uh, thank Charlie for helping us facilitate this online event today. Uh, we met Charlie at the Netroots Nation conference in St. Louis uh, this summer. We were there presenting our deprogrammer training, and Charlie was there facilitating a really excellent workshop on mindful communication. Um, Charlie is a mindfulness and communications coach, and he's just recently launched a new program to help liberals and conservatives talk to each other uh, and connect in a meaningful way. Um, we were really happy to take part in the first uh, kickoff event of that Real Conversations series. The second one is coming up on Tuesday, October 18th, um, and Charlie will be facilitating it through Maestro Conference. And uh, this is a perfect uh, event to invite uh, a friend to. If you have a friend or a family member who's on the opposite side of the political divide and you want to start uh, breaking down the walls that have been built up between you, invite them to this event on Tuesday. We'll be participating in it as well, and we'll share a link with how to register um, at the end of today's session. So thank you, Charlie, once again. So uh, thank you guys, and so happy to be here supporting this amazing work you guys are doing. Oh, thanks. Really yeah. Definitely. Thank you so much, Charlie. This is excellent. And, you know, the experience uh, that brings Aaron and myself to uh, this work specifically on media, is our years as grassroots organizers in our home turf of southwestern Pennsylvania. We've worked on a range of issues affecting American families, and we saw uh, up close and personal the impact of agenda-driven, divisive media on the public debate and, their, and the public's understanding of important issues. In particular, our work on the incredibly contentious fight for health care reform showed us that we needed to work directly on the, the issue of, uh, of media misinformation. And we also saw, um, like I'm sure many of you have, friends and family members really start to change um, as they watched and listened to more and more right-wing media. It really start, started to infect uh, their hearts and minds. So this Trump phenomenon doesn't really feel like a surprise to us, and it probably doesn't to many of you. You know, we've been watching this change, especially in our region, uh, coming for a long time. So how about folks out there, have you been asking yourself, how did we get here? Um, have you had those moments where you ask yourself, how could someone possibly possibly believe what they're saying right now? So if any, anybody, let's, you know, I think it's a good time to do a little bit of, uh, you know, like venting because this is a crazy time and it's just everywhere. You can't get away from it. So folks want to briefly share your thoughts, uh, you know, uh, on this moment that we're at. So just uh, let, let's hear from you. Yeah. Kevin, how's it going? Good. Hey, I met you guys before and I, uh, at the screening of the film, mm -hmm. and we had talked about uh, the struggles that I was having with my parents and how they have changed and how they weren't, they weren't the people that raised me anymore, and I didn't know who they were. So we watched the film, and I thought that would be contention. I wasn't sure how that was going to go, okay? So we watched the film, finally. And nobody said anything. <laughs> <laughs> there was dead silence afterwards. I was surprised that 
They didn't say, make any comments during. And then there was dead silence. And we just moved along like nothing ever happened. <laughs> wow. So they said that uh, your yeah. folks watched the movie with you in its entirety. In, in its entirety. Nobody walked out. Nobody left. Nobody made any comments. And then it just. It's like it didn't even happen. So, okay, flash forward to just maybe uh, three nights ago, Thursday night. Thursday night. Uh, I, we start talking, me and my dad, right before dinner, because like I was telling you, we have dinner every Thursday. We watch movies together every Thursday. And mm-hmm. I had watched some of the maybe movies that we had suggested, too. And um, for a minute and a half, the conversation was, was going back and forth. Oh, I recognize your point. Oh, I see what you're saying. And it, it exploded like a volcano in no time. Ended up in a horrible, horrible shouting match where I was asked to leave. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. So that's where I'm at now. Mm-hmm. It's been a very rough few days, and it's just I, I, it's very frustrating. These aren't, these aren't the people. If you knew them, you would be like, what? They did what? They said what? You know, because that's not who they are. Mm-hmm. And it still isn't who they are, but it's who they become, and it's very frustrating. So it, it, it's... I'll let it go with that. Yeah, mm-hmm. no. So it, it's definitely... This is, a, this is a serious, and it's a tough nut to crack. What we're talking about here is the brainwashing of my dad. Yeah, yeah, for folks that haven't uh, seen it, yeah, the brainwashing of my dad.com. You can uh, rent it or, or buy the DVD. Um, in, the, in it, the director, Jen Senko, uh, shares a personal story of um, very similar to what Kevin just described, watching her father change from someone who was, you know, kind, gentle, apolitical, uh, change into someone who was really radicalized, uh, bigoted, hateful, uh, intensely polarizing, and never missing an opportunity to, you know, beat others down with his opinions, you know, uh, and rantings, you know, that were coming straight from right-wing media. So that's the film uses that personal story to explore the larger changes in the media and it's a story, as Jen found out, and as Kevin just shared, that's happening to families all over the country. Um, and it's, it is, I mean, it's, it's sad, it's frightening to think about people that, that you love who, um, you know, who instilled in you the values that you have suddenly transform into people who uh, just seem unrecognizable. Right. And it seems like you definitely, the movie definitely gave them uh, a lot to think about. Would you say that that's, that's true, Kevin? Well, yeah, do you know, but do you know what his comment was? He said to me, he said, where did you get that movie? <laughs> and he was real mean about it. And I said, I got it on Amazon. And he goes, Amazon, huh? And then he named the owner of Amazon and how much money that person gave to the Democratic Party. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, was like, wow. Yeah, well, he's, you know, that's, he's, he's firing back, but at least uh, he, he saw the movie. And, you know, hopefully we can figure out a way and, you know, you can figure out a way down the road to, uh, to, 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 I don't know, continue the conversation and bend the dynamic. And that's what we're talking about. And, you know, we're going to make our case today. And I think Kevin's testifying to that, that, uh, you know, we're living, what we're living through right now is a state of, of media driven mass delusion. You know, the Trump campaign itself is founded on, on a delusion, right? Trump exists as a candidate because he played directly into the birther base. You know, the right wing uh, noise machine constructed an alternate reality where it wasn't enough to disagree with President Obama or not like him. Uh, you know, he had to be a foreign other. Right. He had to be out to destroy America. Uh, and Donald Trump played into that that narrative for all it was worth. So we're going to we're going to discuss now we're going to discuss two well-known instances of mass hysteria uh, in American history that will give us insight into what's happening today with the right wing media. And we're going to discuss uh, how understanding these cases can help us expose our current media situation. So our overarching goal today is to develop strategies to get people to see the manipulation of right-wing media, uh, to get them to see the trick um, over time, right? It's not it's not an instantaneous thing. We have to work on people over time, but we're going to talk about how to do that here right. and strategize together. So we see, you know, we see that Trump supporters are very willing to act out uh, in the real world on conspiracy on misplaced outrage and on scary misinformation, you know, that they're picking up uh, from their media sources. Uh, and that reminds us that there was a case in mass media history with, where thousands, thousands, you know, of Americans panicked over a completely fictional, scary story. So what am I, what instance am I referring to? Anybody? You need a hint? Oh, I want, uh, you guys want me to have 
Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Let's just, do that. Just uh, if anyone's gonna, if anyone's planning on noisily eating a sandwich, just uh, just mute your phone. Um, but yeah, that'd be great. So we, yeah, so everyone's kind of live. We had everyone usually had some people muted. We're not picking up back on that. So we've got everyone uh, unmuted right now. So yeah, if you're in a noisy place or yeah, you're eating a sandwich, please mute yourself. Um, or we have open mic. So. Hi, hey everybody on the open mic. So what are we talking about? All right. <laughs> All right. Exactly. I guess we kind of put that in the uh, description of the event, but still good. Very good. So that's right. We're talking about the War of the World. So what happened there? Anybody? What What the folks remember about the war? The infamous uh, War of the Worlds uh, radio panic. People believed it. They believed it. What did they believe? They believed that aliens were invading. Right. They. They. Lots of. Not everybody. But plenty of people, thousands of uh, people, believe that uh, we were under attack by Martians. Uh, what, any, what else? What, what else do folks know about that? Do they remember or have they heard about the War of the Worlds incident? Who, 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 uh, who, uh, who produced it? Yeah, or Orson Welles in the Mercury Theater, right? Uh, so it was 1938. It was Halloween Eve. Americans cleared the dinner uh, dishes, and they sat down for some family entertainment. Uh, they clicked on their radios, and this is what Americans heard. Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in the War of the World. The War of the World. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. Government Meteorological Bureau has requested the large observatories of the country to keep an astronomical watch on any further disturbances occurring on the planet Mars. We are ready now to take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, where Carl Phillips, our commentator, will interview Professor Richard Pearson, famous astronomer. How do you account for these gas eruptions occurring on the surface of the planet at regular intervals? Mr. Phillips, I cannot account for it. Yeah, just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. The uh, metal casing is definitely extra terrestrial. Uh, not found on this earth. Okay, Mr. Phillips, something's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is terrifying. Don't panic. Is anybody still there? Is everybody still there? Yeah. Yeah. So. So that that's what folks heard, right? And and uh, thousands of people believed it. And you know they clogged the roads and they clogged the switchboards. And uh, church services were turned into end of the world vigils. Uh, uh, and there was a real panic. But the question is, why why did people believe? You know, because the rate, you know, kind of the understanding I think from our, the distance of time is those folks were so naive they would believe anything, right? They were just you know naturally uh, so so stupid back then, right? But you know, that's not the case. You know, the radio was full of fictional dramas. It was full of scary stories that had never caused a panic. People knew what a fictional story was on the radio, but nobody ever panicked because of the shadow or Flash Gordon or because of any uh, of the more realistic, uh, you know, war dramas and, that were on the radio. They knew what a fictional story was. Uh, so listening to that clip, what, why do folks think that fooled so many people? Here. Who said? Yeah, who said that? <laughs> who said about the news? Audrey. Yeah. Audrey. Okay. Audrey. Way to go, Audrey. Exactly. Right. So Orson Welles was bored with this story. He didn't want to produce uh, this old science fiction story by uh, uh, you know uh, from the past. He thought it was a, a dumb idea. So he looked for a. Uh, he was a brilliant young guy, and he wanted to have a dramatic twist to his story. So he said, what if we make it sound like an ongoing newscast? Will that heighten the drama? Will that make it more interesting? Well, it sure did, right? It, it, in fact, even though it, it was advertised and it was opened as a normal uh, fictional drama and there, were ad and there were commercials throughout and announcements throughout that, that told people it was fictional, people, thousands of people still believed it because they heard that we interrupt this broadcast. And folks interviewed after the fact uh, who were willing to admit that they fell for it uh, that was the overwhelming consensus. I heard it on the news. CBS News had never lied to me before. You know, and I talked to a, a, wom a woman in Pittsburgh who's uh, uh, 
grandparents fell for it, and that's exactly what they said. They said, look, you know, we, they, that was the news. They, they, you know, uh, we interrupt this broadcast. Um, so what did you, what did people notice there just in that little excerpt? And this is, uh, if you want to get folks together for Halloween party, listening to the original broadcast is a really good, uh, would be a really fun thing and also a way to, to make the connections uh, that we're going to make <laughs> today. But what did you notice in, in how that drama was created, just in that short clip that we played? What cues did you pick up? Yeah, what, what, uh, what, what, what did you notice there that might have heightened the believability in terms of making it sound like a, a, a real news broadcast? And, Charlie, I, I mean, the emotion, you know, when you, when you hear someone talking to me like there's this other news report and there's this emotion of the urgency, like and it starts to trigger that, that fear response. Like, you know, I go, oh, my God, this is really happening. Absolutely. I know, yeah, absolutely. And there's, 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 that, there's two points on that is that, you know, you're at your typical, you know, a, a, you know, especially back in the, in the good old days, a journalist was, you know, trained to, to re- remain calm, even in, in, you know, scary, uh, emergency situations. But what Wells did there was he had reporters, you know, actors playing reporters, of course, who sounded genuinely panicked, right? So that you can imagine how that uh, somebody thinking that they were listening to a real reporter when they're used to hearing reporters, even in war scenarios, sound more sound calm. Right. Even, you know, under bad circumstances, how that would affect uh, the, the public. Uh, and, and what else did folks hear? There was uh, did fo- folks hear uh, anything else in, in that short clip that kind of helped uh, helped heighten the reality or, you know, the buy in the authenticity of, of that uh, that production? Well, they used a lot of sound effects and things too. Yeah, they went out of their way to make it sound, you know, obviously dramatic and real. And there was another thing is I think it was Orson Welles himself there playing, you know, the the scientific expert being interviewed on the news, right? You can almost kind of hear his lab coat there, right? You know, oh yes, we we picked up these disruptions on Mars. So this idea of bringing in uh, experts being interviewed on the news, right, was something that people were very familiar familiar with in terms of actual you know, news broadcasting. And Orson Welles was the first to do this. And he got in kind of a lot of trouble. They dragged him before Congress and there was, you know, uh, some hearings about, you know, what, what, it, what had occurred in the Martian panic, specifically, you know, the responsible use of, of uh, mass communication. So, but when you think about Fox and Fox News and Roger Ailes, you see that he pretty much follows the Wells formula, right? If you make it look and sound like the news, Right. If you dress up, you know, get the sets right. And, uh, you know, you have the crawl underneath there and people. um, Get a little feedback. You know, not everybody, just like with the Orson Welles event, not everybody will fall will fall for it. But lots of people will. If you make it sound like the news, you can fool a lot of people. So um, Dorothy Thompson, I don't know if folks have heard of Dorothy Thompson before, uh, but she was a groundbreaking journalist who um, really got the power of propaganda. She was actually in Germany reporting on uh, Hitler's rise, and Hitler kicked her out of Germany because she was on to the way that he was using uh, the radio and these propaganda techniques to uh, whip up mass hysteria. And she wrote really a blistering editorial in the wake of the War of the Worlds uh, panic, which I would definitely recommend to you read in its entirety. We have it on our website. Um, but this is just a little excerpt. Uh, she wrote, Quote, a few effective voices accompanied by sound effects can so convince masses of people of a totally unreasonable, completely fantastic proposition as to create nationwide panic. They, meaning Orson Welles and Mercury Theater, have demonstrated beyond question of a doubt the appalling dangers and enormous effectiveness of popular and theatrical demagoguery. If you think about that term, popular and theatrical demagoguery, it's like you could almost be talking directly to Donald Trump, right? reality TV star, uh, you know, uh, uh, pro wrestling guy. So um, so as she went on to say, the power of mass suggestion is the most potent force today. The political demagogue is more powerful than all the economic forces. No political body must ever, under any circumstances, obtain a monopoly of radio. And now we have a situation where what not, not at least 95 percent of talk radio uh, is coming from the more and more extreme ideological political right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, Fox News is the number one uh, top-rated uh, cable news channel. So we want to talk about uh, Roger Ailes now. Um, what do folks know about Roger Ailes and his background? Anybody? 
Yeah, yeah there you go. Who said that? Randall. Randall, Randall. exactly. So, um, yes, and a lot of people don't know that. Uh, so Roger Ailes uh, was a TV uh, whiz kid. He was a executive producer of the Mike Douglas show out of Cleveland, and that's where he met Richard Nixon, uh, who came on the show. And, uh, you know, Nixon obviously was not coming across well on television. I uh, thought it was a gimmick. Ailes said, you know, no, it's not. You don't get the power of television. I do. I can I can coach you on how to to uh, use this medium uh, to connect with people. So that's where Ailes began his career as a Republican political operative at very high levels. He worked on the presidential campaigns of Richard Nixon, of Ronald Reagan, of George H.W. Bush. He also worked as a lobbyist for the tobacco industry when they were actively working against uh, health care reform under the Clinton administration. So uh, Roger Ailes, unlike the heads of the other two um, cable news networks, MSNBC and CNN, has absolutely no background in journalism whatsoever. He's got decades of experience in television production. Uh, he's also got an extreme ideological agenda, but understanding uh, how to do the news Right. Give the who, what, where, when, why and how was never something he encountered. <laughs> right. So it was a, a propaganda tool for Roger Ailes to, to set up a, a network called Fox News uh, just as a, a form of cover. Right. And there's a lot more of, of that background in the, in the brainwashing of my dad. Mm -hmm. So if Roger Ailes followed the Wells formula, Orson Wells formula of, uh, you know, dressing up uh, fiction and fear as news, there are other, there's other more fringe voices that are going with something even scarier and more dangerous, taking it like from science fiction to a pure American horror story. So uh, here's uh, one of those uh, very, very fringe voices right here with Donald Trump. If something horrible comes out and Trump comes out and agrees he did it, I will then weigh it. But there's I, I'm never a lesser of two evils person. But with Hillary, there's not even the same universe. I mean, she is an abject, psychopathic demon from hell that as soon as she gets into power is going to try to destroy the planet. I'm sure of that. And people around her say she's so dark now and so evil and so possessed that they are having nightmares. They're freaking out. Folks, let me just tell you something. And, and, and if the media wants to go with this, that's fine. There are dozens of videos and photos of Obama having flies land on him indoors at all times of year, and he'll be next to 100 people and no one has flies on him. Hillary reportedly... I mean, I was told people around her that they think she's demon-possessed, okay? I'm just going to go ahead and say it, okay? They said they're scared. That's why when I see her, when kids are by her, I actually get scared myself for the child. I mean, you that big rubber face and that... I mean, this woman is dangerous, ladies and gentlemen. That's, I'm telling you. She is a demon. This is biblical. She's going to launch a nuclear war. So Jones, Alex Jones is a Trump supporter. I don't know if everybody's aware of that, right? And it's kind of hard to wrap your head around uh, that not only is Jones a Trump supporter, but Trump is a guest, has been a guest on the Jones show. Um, he, Trump said, quote, your reputation is amazing. Uh, I won't let you down, close quote, right? So he's, he's very much on board. He's, he's really brought these fringe voices, uh, you know, more into the mainstream through his candidacy. And, you know, it's, Stunning. I don't uh, if you know that folks are take will take somebody like Alex Jones seriously, but lots of folks at the rally on Monday that we talked to uh, were of the opinion that Fox News, you know, had softened up and sold out, and they were mean to Donald Trump. But yes, Alex Jones is great. We're, you know, so we've moved. You know, for us, it was always about Fox News setting up this false front, saying it's news so you can believe it, like doing the, the uh, you know Orson Welles' War of the Worlds. Thing where you know you disguise it as news so that helps give it credibility. But now it seems like folks are moving to the point, or a lot of folks, where all, all all you need is a microphone, right? It doesn't even have to really it's just just a microphone and somebody with a lot of uh, you know uh, crazy emotional uh, talk, right? So uh, what case? So when you listen to the the Alex Jones uh, ravings right there, what case of historical mass hysteria does it remind you of? Anyone? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It, uh, it sure does, right? So, uh, is, so what do folks know or remember uh, about the Salem witch trials? Re remember from school? I assume none of us were there. <laughs> um, I was very 
That, yep, that's that's correct. You know, there were uh, there were uh, folks were killed, uh, were executed. Fourteen women and five men uh, were hanged. One man was crushed to death by stone. Interestingly, uh, if you confessed and you admitted to being, you know, uh, in league with the devil, then you could live. But the folks, the the, the folks who di- ultimately died were the ones who refused to capitulate and say, you know, this is true. Uh, so it, uh, it began at the home of the, the Salem minister, uh, uh, Minister Paris, uh, when his young niece, uh, 11, and daughter, 9, began exhibiting bizarre behavior and hysterical fits. Uh, their condition was diagnosed by the village physician as the evil hand, which was not an uncommon diagnosis at the time, it meant, meaning that they were under the influence of some outside diabolical supernatural force. Uh, not long after that, the girls who were probably prompted by, you know, questioning adults, uh, began making specific ac- accusations about who was afflicting them with witchcraft. So over the next months, uh, next several months, paranoia, suspicion, and fear swept the, the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and between 144 and 185 people were accused of witchcraft in, in 25 villages. Uh, so the testimony of people who were accused, they were confessing, uh, you know, many, many folks were confessing and they were telling these elaborate stories about a conspiracy of witches to overthrow the church and, and even the state. Uh, you know, so, you know, Orson Welles, in order to convince people of his mass delusion that Martians were invading, uh, he had to pretend that it was coming from a credible and trusted source, you know, from the news. Right. But the people of Salem, they didn't have to be convinced that witches were real. Uh, you know, they were religious fundamentalists. They already had a deep belief in witchcraft uh, and what the appropriate punishment, the biblical punishment should be, which is, you know, suffer not a witch to live, uh, as it says in Exodus, right? So there was, there were no newspapers. You know, the only media the people of Salem knew was the pulpit, you know, and of course, word of mouth and gossip and rumor and uh, what they eventually saw and heard at the trials, much of which was people confessing that this was actually happening. So uh, this kind of fundamentalism, um, provides a simple, powerful, and stark narrative to live by, right? Good versus evil, cleanly defined. It uh, provides meaning to life by giving that person a plain understanding of their place and role in the world. Um, so even if it is a harsh system, it puts uh, that believer firmly on the side of God and of righteousness. Right. You know, uh, so the, the fits, you know, what happened with the girls and their fits and th- those fits being diagnosed as, demonic in nature by authorities and then their accusations and the, and the testimony and confessions of the accused, this, you know, that confirmed the worst fears that are inherent in the fundamentalist, uh, the fundamentalist belief system of the villagers, that the devil was a real, the devil was alive and he was running rampant in, you know, through Salem. So the response was uh, inevitable. It was baked into those beliefs that those accused and con- and convicted uh, who did not admit to their crime would have to be put to death. Uh, that was all that, that their fundamentalist worldview would allow, right? So how does this help us understand this, Salem, this example of Salem? So listening, thinking about the Salem uh, example and the, uh, you know, the witch trials, how does this help us understand how we got to Trump? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Thinking about the war of the worlds and then now the Salem example. So if the if the galvanizing call, go ahead. Do I hear someone? I'm sorry. I'm not sure. No, I was going to say that it was about with the witch show that the women were standing to inherit property, and the men didn't want that to happen. And again, the chivalry is standing to become powerful, and men are against that. Yeah, you know, it wasn't all women, you know, who were accused and, and, and uh, executed for witchcraft, but there, there is a point there that uh, predominantly folks, the ones who were accused of witchcraft, more way more often than not were women. Um, so that yeah, that, that there's definitely uh, that there's definitely something there. Mm-hmm. Uh, any, anybody else? Like that, you 
know, I don't know, sometimes I think that people who feel really disempowered in some way, um, you know, what, what I see getting drummed up in that clip we saw and, and in the witchcraft thing, you know, it, it's kind of seems part of us that really likes to feel righteous and like we've got it, you know, and, and it kind of makes us good guys and everyone else bad guys. And there's a certain, you know, like a certain high to that almost. And it seems like they kind of play on that too. I don't know. What are your suggestions about that? Yeah, no, I think that I think you're getting right to it there. In that, so, so the right wing media machine of Ailes and Limbaugh, you know, and the rest of the echo chamber, what, what it helped to do, and really the goal of it, was to gradually establish sort of an ideological fundamentalism on the right, right, an absolutism that that ultimately is swallowed up and incorporated Christian fundamentalism under under its order, right? That you know. The, the, that media campaign, you know, and the idea was to indoctrinate people, and it, and it was very effective in indoctrinating millions to a, a sort of fundamentalist belief system. And that system is that the Democrats and the left represent evil and treason, while the right was uh, was all that was righteous and patriotic. And that's exactly what you're saying, Charlie, in terms of like creating a worldview that's very simple, that you get sort of, uh, uh, you know, you, you buy into it. And there's a real payoff in buying into it because you are definitely you're in that narrative. You are the good guy and the bad guy is over there. And it's real simple and clean, and, uh, clean cut. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, you know, that piece of this was done, you know, the Fox News Limbaugh piece was done while maintaining a cut of, a cover of credibility by insisting that Fox was a legitimate news source. Right. You know, and that Limbaugh was just giving the conservative point of view that the so-called liberal media would not allow to be heard. Right. So they had that, that kind of plausible deniability in that cover. But the real goal was to, to really infect people with this notion of you know, these very simple fundamentalist political ideas. Right. Um, if that makes sense. Right. So that what we saw then with President Obama coming in, you know, winning the election after the disaster of George W. Bush. Right. You know, the first African-American to hold the office, you know, the right wing media machine went into overdrive to demonize Obama and construct this alternate reality for, uh, for, for you know, the, the adherence of right-wing media. So th- that's where you got the Obama derangement syndrome, you know, and even more rigid ideological fundamentalism. So if you think uh, this, um, you know, Trump that bitch, uh, I, I don't know if other folks are seeing yard signs. Uh, we saw a yard sign, uh, one of our neighbors on our dog walking route, uh, you know, down on the other end of town has got, proudly displaying a sign that says this in their front yard, you know, with kids play along the street. Um, but if you think about, especially in in the last week, really what's happening at, at the Trump rallies, what, you know, the chance of lock her up, um, you know, not just now about Clinton, but about some of the accusers that are coming forward to accuse uh, Donald Trump of sexual assault, you know, an angry mob in the crowd chanting lock her up, right? So the, the parallels, I think, uh, are really striking, you know, burn the witch being the galvanizing call during the Salem witch trials, you know, to now Trump that bitch. I mean, it's just, um, it's, it's really scary to think about uh, the connection and, and where we've come. It's reduced, it's reduced to just such absolutist stark terms. And when you have a fundamentalist, a system based on just that kind of absolutism and fundamentalism, it, there's a, an inherent vulnerability, right? Cause the witch her- you know, why the witch hysteria happened was they had this very rigid belief system uh, they believed that witches were real. So when that these girl, when the when the girls began acting out it with these with these fits, uh, and it was determined that it was you know witchcraft, you know th- th- that would had to be believed, right? It, so you know whenever you have that kind of confirmation inside of a fundamentalist system, you can have you know a, a, it's very dangerous, right? So Alex Jones and Trump are playing the role of the the afflicted girls of Salem, right? They're throwing their fits and the contortions and ravings. And for the for this uh, right wing base that's been created through Fox News uh, and talk radio, they're confirming the worst fears of that echo chamber created uh, dogma. Right. Uh, You know, Obama and Hillary and the left, they're not just misguided or crazy. The reason they are so completely on the wrong side of everything is because they're actually on the dark side. They're literally evil. They're literally demonic. Um, They're part of a diabolical world conspiracy to destroy all that's good and and, good. Trump's pretty much on the stump right now saying exactly that, this world conspiracy against him. What do you think is the end game? Uh, what, do you, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> that's the truth. That's the truth. We, pull, we pulled you all in here so you could tell us. 
What, the, <laughs> what, what do you what do you what do you think it is? What are, what are you seeing in terms of that? They're not all um, blindly marching behind them. There's all the Republicans who are uh, who are dis- uh, disavowing him, dis- uh, unendorsing him. As they're, they're not so um, much the cheerleaders they were mm-hmm. And I see this thing right off. I don't even know where the track. I mean, what, what are people like Trump and um, Alex Jones thinking they're gonna accomplish? Well, that's what I think. I think that's you know, there's that old saying, right? Some some men just want to watch the world burn, and that's the forces that Ailes and Limbaugh and company have been playing with for a long time, right? They've been playing with these forces, and now we're seeing, uh, you know, where this where this ultimately leads. Where somebody, where a demo, a completely uh, sociopathic, narcissistic demagogue like Trump can just kind of grab that microphone and you know commandeer the whole the whole situation uh, for no other reason than whatever his own personal you know kind of burn it all down mentality uh, is. So so that's where we're at. Um, and we talked a lot. This is what's ter- this is what the point why we're making this point of like like going from War of the Worlds to the Salem Witch Trials. Right. Because that's how things can go. You know, you can you might have a political agenda where you think it's it's valuable it's just to hide what you really want. You pretend it's legitimate news so you can kind of push your agenda, uh, you know, uh, under the radar. But what that does ultimately is create a scenario where there's this ideological extremism that can go in a very, very dangerous direction. Uh, so what we're at is like we're saying, like Aaron said at the beginning, we're at a dangerous point and an ugly point. But it's also a point where potentially we can, and I'm, I'm having this happen with some of my friends who wouldn't listen to me for years when I would talk about, I wouldn't shut up about right-wing media and how dangerous it was, where the Trump phenomena, where they're finally saying, okay, yeah, I, I can, I'm starting to, I can see this now. I can see where uh, this is, this is serious, obviously. So it's an opportunity for people for, to, to reveal this to people. You know, um, so, you know, you, pro, you know, Ailes and Limbaugh, and the prop- propagandists like them and demagogues like Jones and Trump, they know what they're doing. You know, Ailes played the War of the Worlds thing by hiding behind the, the, the cover of news you know, to, to drive a political agenda. But now we have these nihilists coming out of the woodwork and they're taking it further. You know, they're taking it right over the cliff. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, things do look dark right now. But as Dave said, this is also a really important moment and opportunity for a realization, right? And and an understanding of where this all came from. And there's real power in that. So um, having that realization is important, but it's also important for us to have a deeper understanding of how this kind of uh, intense indoctrination happens. So we're going to take a little uh, quick trip into the brain. So, it, uh, so, right. So we want to. So the, the whole the goal of the of this uh, the training with the, the historical examples, and now we're going to take a look inside the brain and try to get a handle on how this sort of indoctrination works. Is if we have a if we have you know as we say you know if having knowledge about something, getting a grasp on it can help us uh, better understand how to how to to uh, fight back against it. Right. So inside the brain. Uh, we have, uh, there's a lot going on, but not all of it's rational, right? We have the neocortex, the outer region, which is where everything that we consider human uh, happens. You know, that's critical thinking, self-reflection, imagination, uh, higher moral reasoning. Uh, that's, you know, obviously the most recent evolutionary uh, feature of our, of our brains, but that's not the whole story. Underneath there, underneath lies, you know, the fear center, uh, what's called the amygdala. It's a small grouping of neurons uh, that's much more evolutionarily primitive, uh, and it's not about thinking at all. It's all about subrational emotions, fear, anger, threat response. Interestingly, also empathy, but only for your in-group, right? Only for your tribe, right? So you can know who's in the tribe and, and know who you have to defend against. Uh, so, you know, we've all heard the phrase scared stupid. Well, you actually can literally be scared stupid. You know, we have this woman, for instance, Kind of re, re, uh, with the lizard brain, uh, you know, uh, in full uh, uh, throttle there, and you know she thinks that the, the best way to, you know, keep her ki- child safe is to have an assault rifle, right? So strong emotion like fear and anger can take us uh, 
you know, the, uh, away from self-reflection, away from higher, you know, from higher brain uh, functions. Uh, it can actually take us to a place where our reasoning capacity shuts down entirely, and that is a state called amygdala hijack. Uh, psychologist and science journalist Daniel Goleman coined the term amygdala hijack as a situation where um, you have a strong emotional reaction to something. Uh, it comes on suddenly. And importantly, you realize upon reflection later that your reaction or your overreaction was inappropriate. So when you're in the throes of an amygdala hijack, uh, your, your lizard brain, as we see here on the screen, uh, is in the driver's seat. So um, a good way to, to think about it and understand it is like road rage. Road rage or, you know, uh, Trump rage, right? We saw, we've seen at the rallies. Uh, so amygdala hijack is, is, uh, plays an important role in understanding the process of indoctrination. Here's how uh, that cycle plays out. Um, you know, Fox News, you know, targets the amygdala. Uh, the fear center with a, with a fear based narrative. It's all dressed up as if it's real, if it's just like War of the Worlds, if it's actually a news uh, story, like Obama is going to kill you with Ebola terrorists, right? Remember Ebola? Uh, that causes, that causes anxiety, which causes a feeling of loss of control. Uh, and, you know, this leads to an increase in negative emotion, which can, you know, anxiety and fear can very easily tip over into anger. And when the emotional response like anger is intense enough, critical thinking is severely diminished. It may even shut down. That's when you're in the amygdala hijack territory. Uh, at that point, once you're in, in the uh, shutdown of critical thinking, uh, the victim is susceptible to indoctrination. Uh, and the propagandist is able to provide a simple, powerful storyline, a narrative that helps return a sense of control in the scary world. Uh, that also gives that, that person a tribe to identify with as well as uh, potentially an answer to any crisis of meaning they may have been experiencing in their life, right? Uh, and then the cycle continues. You know, you return back to that source of, of inf you know, uh, information, your favorite radio or, talk or TV host the next day for an update, and lo and behold, it's another scary story about the bad guys, right? Uh, and it just deepens your sense of identity with that tribe, right? Uh, that's, uh, so, you know, that narrative has such power uh, because it removes all doubt and uncertainty. You know, you're definitely, like Charlie was saying before, you're definitely on the side of the right, uh, and the other is on the, the, uh, the dark side. So that's how, remember, we talked about ideological fundamentalism, uh, you know, created by the echo chamber, and that this indoctrination process is how that, that happens. So our goal has to be to break the cycle and get people to think about and question their attitudes and beliefs and behaviors uh, that are part of the indoctrination process. So, uh, all, you know, we have to get people in touch with all that stuff that happens in the neocortex. Uh, and this isn't about, it's important to realize, you know, we're not talking about converting somebody to being a liberal, right? It's not about converting to a specific point of view. We're talking, you know, talking about, you know, if there is really an indoctrination and manipulation happening through right-wing media, and we think it's apparent that that's, that's an obvious phenomenon that's happening in the culture now, what we're talking about is creating a crack in that absolute certainty of, the, uh, of indoctrination, where we can get someone to question for themselves, you know, that uh, what's happening. And that's, that's what ultimately causes the rigid ideology to crumble. So our core strategy for doing this, we call it inflicting self-reflection. And inflicting self-reflection is uh, just like you see here. It's like holding up a mirror. It's getting someone to stop and think about what they're saying, about how they're behaving, about how others are seeing them in that moment. So when you inflict self-reflection, uh, what you're doing is forcing someone out of uh, reaction mode where they're ready to fight with you, see you as the enemy, uh, spar with you rhetorically, and into reflection mode where they're more available uh, to think and have a genuine conversation um, along with you. So Inflicting self-reflection is a way to create those stop and think moments, which can uh, help people reach conclusions about media influence and manipulation on their own, which is always much more powerful than just simply telling someone, hey, you're being brainwashed by right wing media. Right. That's going to trigger their instinct. That's going to trigger their amygdala and their instinct to fight with you. So we need to have ways to inflict self-reflection to create the space for them to stop, think, ask themselves, do I know what I think I know? and start to connect some of these dots. So what do folks on the call think, uh, what are ways that we can do that? 
what ways can we help people how, uh, to see how they're being manipulated and inflict that critical self-reflection moment instead of just that outward attack mode? De-escalate. Absolutely. So, uh, and thinking about thinking about a mode of conversation that gets people to stop and think, what's a good, what would be a good way to to create that? Exactly. I heard someone say, "Ask questions." That's exactly right. So, um, I think was that that randomly said de-escalate. We're going to talk about that more in a minute on how to uh, detribalize an interaction and make sure that you're breaking that. A dynamic that they're set up for to want to fight with you. Um, but thinking about the kind of questions that we can ask to open the door uh, to a genuine conversation, these are questions um, and segues in the conversation that have worked really well for us. And, uh, you know, Dave has knocked on over 100,000 doors in our area of southwestern Pennsylvania. I've knocked on lots of doors and gone into contentious uh, situations during, you know, the, the heat of the health care uh, debate uh, going into Tea Party areas. So, um, these questions have worked really well for us. Ask or ask someone to, you know, well, tell me more about that. Can you tell me more about that? Um, and asking in a way that doesn't sound like, you know, you're holding the uh, police investigation light over them, but genuinely curious, you know, approaching that interaction with a spirit of curiosity, but also being intentional about directing the conversation in a way that can create those moments those aha realizations about media. So tell me more about that forces someone to think uh, beyond just the simple talking point, bumper sticker explanations they've been given by their media sources. Um, how would that work? Uh, gets people thinking, um, you know, in the future, th thinking about, well, let's say you got what you wanted with this policy or that one. How would that work? What would that look like? Forces people to uh, think about the complexity of the world, to think outside of those black and white terms. Um, where did you hear about that is an important one and, and can also be uh, really revealing. Now, sometimes people are more cagey and they don't want to admit that they watch Fox News. Um, but most of the time, people can't help it. You know, they'll say O'Reilly or Hannity or often. And this is uh, gives you a good opportunity. A lot of times, like when we were talking to folks on Monday, someone will say, oh, well, uh, Judicial Watch or the Heritage Foundation, or they'll name these special interest groups that aren't news sources that clearly have an agenda. Um, so that gives you an opportunity to talk about what the motivation of that source is and why it's important to have a credible arbiter, right? You know, we need to have, um, you know, actual facts, right? An inch has to be an inch if someone's going to build a house. So everything is not <laughs> a matter of opinion. Um, and then this final one is really my favorite in terms of inflicting self-reflection and getting someone to think on a deeper level. Um, is it possible there's more to this story? Might I not be seeing the full picture? Is there a part that's been left out unintentionally or perhaps just because I'm not as familiar with this issue? But is it possible there's more to this story? Can also, we talk about creating that that crack, you know, getting in between someone in their close bond with their media source. If someone feels like they haven't been given the full story, um, you know, by Bill O'Reilly or Sean Hannity or Rush Limbaugh, then uh, they, they start to feel silly, right? Like, oh, this person I trusted sent me out into the world with something and I don't really know what right. I'm talking about. So yeah. that can create those kind of moments where someone can begin, you can plant those seeds. I think like a, a, probably the clearest example of, of, you know, is there more to the story is like often you'll be talking to folks who are, uh, you know, very strong on the, on the gun issue, gun rights and the second amendment. And they'll quote the second amendment, the way that they're hearing it, you know, through the NRA or right wing media. And it's always, almost always just part of the actual amendment. Right. It's almost always they don't it's the cherry pick part. and It's not the, the part that kind of complicates it with the, uh, you know, uh, regulation uh, and militia, you know, well-regulated militia part. Uh, often we've had folks do that. They'll just say that, you know, shall not be infringed part. And, and it's also happened where you ask them to quote the entire amendment and they don't know it. Right. So that's you know, it's, it's not to necessarily to embarrass someone, but it's just to help that help somebody see if they're just being selectively informed. Mm -hmm. Right. And help them see that for themselves. And I think, Randall, you said about de-escalating and that we kind of uh, did this in reverse order because it, we, uh, it, you, before you can have a conversation with somebody and ask them the kinds of questions that, uh, and, you know, have a, a genuine conversation and ask questions that might help reveal something to them about their media sources. You have to make, you have to make, make sure that you can have that conversation 
on a non uh, heated platform. Mm-hmm. So uh, remember the amygdala hijack, right? And you can't, and also, you know, don't be too hard on yourself because we're wired to respond to threats, even rhetorical threats. So when we feel like our deeply held uh, beliefs or values are under attack, like seeing this sign, social justice is tyranny, um, if I was on the other side of that rally in town, I'd be a little keyed up. You know, my heart would be beating a little bit faster. My palms might get a little sweaty. So you can't help the physiological reaction that you're going to feel, but you can recognize it, take some deep breaths, overcome it. Um, remember that uh, we, in this example, Sally T. Sour post, right? You see the sour look on her face and her son. Um, you know, she's a human being just like you. She has a family uh, just like you. Um, she's obviously out there because she cares about the country uh, just like you do. So um, take a minute to stop and remind yourself that that other person uh, is a human being, right? Uh, establish that connection, use humor. Um, but just remember that when, you know, she's ready to fight with you. Sally here is ready to fight with you, get into a rhetorical back and forth where you guys just, you know, shout past each other. What she's not ready for is to be um, forced to look inward, to question her views. So uh, by detribalizing that interaction, um, you're creating the opportunity to have a conversation that goes deeper and really gets at the source of perhaps some of her anxieties or insecurities that are being um, so effectively uh, exploited by right wing media. Right. And, you know, we, we give the rally. We have the, uh, Sally there at the rally. But, you know, most of these conversations aren't going to happen at rallies where it mm-hmm. can be most contentious or, uh, you know, heated mm-hmm. uh, or where people are just extremely locked into their camps. A lot of times it's just going to be with friends or family in less uh you know contentious uh surroundings right so you know uh so you know you don't always have to be geared up for you know complete warfare or Mm -hmm. approaching somebody when they're you know entrenched in in that kind of a situation and that's that was actually a a huge takeaway for us when we went to the um trump event on monday uh that was just a few blocks down the street is that you know when we talk about uh removing this kind of toxic media as um a poisonous influence in the culture getting people away from it uh depolarizing breaking down those walls of polarization that have been so built up by this media it really it really has to happen over time and it has to happen in settings that aren't already politicized so you can only get so far in a conversation right with Sally at a rally or with someone you know at a Trump event but where you can really start to make progress is in the quiet moments um, when you're spending time with your parents or your friend um, and, you know, things haven't been politicized and you can start to have a conversation that can create these uh, stop and think moments about media influence. So we, uh, you know, we have to be realistic about the problem. Um, We didn't get here overnight, right? It took 30 years of this uh, very well orchestrated media uh, infrastructure and, and plan to get us to this point where people are so constantly in a state of, you know, frenzy and, and anger, we're not going to get back overnight. Um, and that's why we talk about bending the curve, you know, de-escalating, depoliticizing these interactions over time and getting people uh, gradually planting the seeds so that they can gradually realize the influence this toxic media is having on them and choose themselves to remove it from their lives, right? If ultimately people go back to being more rational Republicans and more rational Democrats, great. You know, like Dave said, this isn't about converting to one point of view or another. It's about rejecting uh, media, inflammatory media that pushes our buttons in this kind of a way with, with these kind of, uh, t- you know, ugly results. So, um, uh- what, any questions or comments about uh, what we're talking about up to this point? Does this make, does this make sense? Does this, does this resonate with folks' experience? Have, have, have folks had reason? I know Kevin talked about his recent uh, experience with his parents. Uh, what are what are other people experiencing, and how are you how are you handling it in terms of uh, trying to communicate with people, uh, you know, kind of who are bought into some of this stuff? I wanted to share that I showed a watching movie to my son, who uh, has been, I would call, a victim of the downstairs TV, my husband on Fox News, as opposed to the upstairs TV with MSNBC going on. Mm. Um, unfortunately, has been manipulated on many of tendencies, ways to view things, and uh, 
end of the movie, she said, um, that kind of hurts my feelings. And I thought that was pretty interesting. I know we have to sure suggest a recognized person there with securities and uh, some places being uh, assuaged or comforted by, by uh, manipulation and rhetoric and, and uh, amygdala hijacking and um, really work to find compassion and to help um, move us through making these, uh, breaking down these walls. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, you have to, you have to find, look for those moments where you can have the most productive interaction with, with someone, uh, you know, where you can really connect with them again, because it, what, what this force wants, what it, what it's brought us to is it, it wants these divisions. It feeds on these divisions, right? And it's easy. And, you know, and I, you know, you can check out some of the videos of me talking with people. I've had, you know, good interactions and not so good interactions. Uh, and it's real easy to get caught up in the ugliness um, and uh, real easy. But, you know, it's, this, that's why this we're talking about, you know, you know, going forward with this, we have to keep our eye on, on the ball and how critical it is that we break through this phenomenon. But it's going to be – that's why it has to be a movement, something that we do consistently over time. You get very few doorstep conversions or instantaneous conversions, right? It's just helping people see through this. And I think the Trump – like we're saying, the Trump moment is a real opportunity for this because uh, reality really matters, right? I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not optional. Uh, and when some force moves you so, moves the country and so many people so far away from basic facts and truths, uh, that, that has to be an opportunity for us to get people to see that, right? So um, you know, one of the big tools that they use that we've talked about to kind of you know, take over and hijack reality is the power of narrative, because human beings are built to respond to stories, right? Stories are very crucial, and they're just a part of who we are as human beings. It's part of our survival is to hear stories and, and you know, kind of get caught up in them, especially emotional stories, right? And propagandists know that, and they use that tool. Uh, to get people in, like we talked about, in these very simple black and white narratives, good versus evil. Uh, but we can also use the power of narrative to reveal uh, truth, right? Uh, so you, know, you don't have to get into a back and forth with somebody about the phony thing that they're whipped up about from right-wing media that day. You know, you can tell a story that helps get under that, that, that absolute certainty that they have about their information and their media source. You know, we want to get people wondering, do I know what I think I know? So there are stories we can tell. Um, like the stories that we told today about the War of the Worlds uh, Martian Panic radio broadcast. Uh, so, you know, Halloween coming up is a great opportunity to get some people over, listen to the original broadcast, and then talk about how, um, you know, news today is formatted, like, you know, for, for drama and sensationalism and fear and why that's dangerous for democracy, you know. Um, Talk about the Salem witch trials, making connections to uh, the kind of uh, just baseless rumors and accusations and hysteria that's really gripping uh, a huge part of America today. Um, and also, you know, a lot of folks don't know who Alex Jones is, right? And so a lot of these talk radio folks get to walk this line where they say, oh, well, it's just entertainment. But at the same time, they're putting out really ugly and dangerous misinformation that's causing people to act in the real world. Like, for example, Alex Jones, uh, you know, believes lots of things are false flags. That's a common theme on his show. Uh, but he actually believes that St uh, Sandy Hook, the Sandy Hook uh, massacre um, was staged and, th and there were child actors that were killed. And that actually has led to harassment of the parents. So that that's a, that telling people that gives them pause. You know, about well, we talked to a woman coming out of the rally on Monday at the Trump rally with she had brought her three children. And obviously she was a huge supporter of Trump and knew who Alex Jones was. But when we talked about the Sandy Hook conspiracy and, uh, you know, we, how dangerous we thought it was that Trump was associating himself with somebody who would push that kind of ugly conspiracy theory and how it was, you know, leading to parents being harassed. I mean, she listened, you know, once again, it wasn't a, a, a hallelujah conversion. But she was clearly disturbed by that. And what, it, what the reaction she had was to defend Trump that, you know, well, he would want to be on any show he could be on to get his message out. And, I, and you know, we, you know, so we had, she didn't, you know, uh, 
suddenly dump Trump in that moment, but it clearly got under her skin and she took the literature that I offered her at the end of the conversation. You know, uh, so that, you know, so these, there has to be ways to get underneath some of this, this stuff, right? And just helping people see that Roger Ailes was, is liter was literally using, you know, what, what, we shouldn't say literally, but you know, cause he never <laughs> confessed to it, like literally, but, but, but you can see clearly that what Roger Ailes is doing is using you know, telling that story, if somebody wants to fight, you know, get into a heated conversation about the latest, you know, talking point, say, you know, you can tell that story about, about the war of the world, you know, be engaging, be funny, uh, tell, you know, tell a good story that people want to listen to. And before they before they even realize it, they've gotten a message about their media source uh, that they weren't expecting to get. You know, it seems to me that that's what Roger Ailes is doing. He just he pretended that something was news just to sell you a scary story. Now, that doesn't mean they instantly accept that. But you you just force them to listen to an interesting and uh, compelling story that they're going to have to walk away with and think about. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing uh, that we can do is remind people of past crises that were blown way out of proportion. So how many um, folks here died of Ebola in 2014? <laughs> <laughs> right. So we yeah let's we can we can remind folks of and this is a very powerful one. Uh, remember the Ebola panic of 2014, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, we were all supposed to be dead. And if you listen to the right wing media echo chamber in particular, the federal government was doing everything wrong. It was 180 degrees from, you know, what they should be doing. Seal, you know, uh, Trump was on Twitter, you know, seal the borders, all that stuff. Uh, Obama's going to kill us all. And of course, the, the fact is that the, the federal response worked to control the disease in the country uh, and to save thousands of lives in West Africa. It worked. But you didn't see Fox coming back later and saying, oops, we got that one wrong, right? They used it as a propaganda uh, tool, and then they moved on to the next thing. But we don't have to move on. We can remind people, right, about things, that, you know, reality versus what they said, right? You know, um, so that's a good story to tell. You know, when somebody wants to say, I know that I know that, I, that this, is, this is true because I heard it on Fox or I heard it from whoever. Take them, walk them back through the Ebola story, Right. And, you know, uh, maybe this thing that you're hyped up about today is just as far from reality as the Ebola thing turned out to be back in 2014. Mm -hmm. So um, the other thing that became very clear to us uh, on Monday is that, um, you know, often like be interested to hear who's who's on today that's done advocacy or, you know, a campaign for an issue or for a candidate in the past. Often you feel compelled to go after the hardest nut to crack, right? So you want to, you you feel this compulsion to get conversions, right? To bring someone to your side on an issue or for a candidate. But really, when we think about the spread of this media poison, we need to think about it much more like a public health crisis. And when we think about it in those terms, we can see that the real work lies in preventing the next generation of people from getting trapped in this toxic echo chamber. Um, and it's, definitely going to take some work. And we talked to a lot of young people, people in there, you know, just out of high school that listen to Alex Jones, whether they're listening to him intentionally as a news source or not, the narratives that he, that they're picking up, they're acting on and it's influencing their beliefs and their perceptions and their actions in the world. So um, we do have to get very active in exposing uh, what this kind of media does Um and so we just launched an effort partnering with uh, Jen Senko, director of the Brainwashing My Dad, uh, to do this. Um, what you see on the screen right now is a card that we came up with uh, together with Jen that you can leave uh, with an establishment, you know, with a local restaurant or YMCA or your doctor's office if they're showing Fox News. Um, one of our supporters, David Dudine, uh, talked about how you know, this right wing media has kind of become like the wallpaper in our nation's house. Right. You go, and when you go in, especially to a setting like the YMCA or a restaurant, you see it on and it just becomes normalized and we can't let that happen. Uh, so this card campaign is a way that we're working to actively uh, encourage people to um, have those conversations, to go in and say, look, um, turn Fox off, right? Uh, and, and be able to talk to that business owner or manager or employee about why Fox isn't news, why it's divisive and polarizing, how it's misinforming people. Um, the link on the back of the card goes to a page on our website that has um, some of the studies that show Fox's misinformation effect 
um, and also gives more of the history about Roger Ailes and his background. So we really designed the page that this directs people to um, for middle of the road people who might not know why Fox is bad. Um, but this is a really important, simple thing we can do to make sure that these toxic media messages aren't normalized. Right, that we're stigmatizing it mm -hmm. over time, Just right? Just like with smoke. And, and the more people who would who would do this and take up a, a campaign like this and take it seriously, the quicker we could stigmatize uh, this kind of media. I mean, there was like if you think about smoking, there was a time when everybody smoked all the time, right? In the 50s, you know, everybody was doctors were smoking over patients while they were, you know, uh, doing surgery, right? Everybody smoked. It was kind, it was everywhere, but. Over the years, it's become stigmatized. Uh, the public uh, uh, information, uh, you know, campaigns have convinced most people that it's dangerous um, and that it, it, uh, it's people still smoke, but it's much, much less than it used to be. So it's, there, there's been a big shift, right, in, in perceptions and behavior around smoking for the better, right? And that's what that's what we have to do uh, with media.